Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today, I'm sharing with you a conversation I had with Dr. Drew Remignanti about his book, The Healing Connection, A Partnership for Your Health. Dr. Remignanti is an emergency room physician, and we talk a lot about what happens when people end up in the ER without an advanced directive. And then some of his other thoughts on slow medicine, uh, compassion in healthcare, and I think you'll find it really enjoyable. So if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and also subscribe and leave a rating and review wherever you happen to listen to the podcast. If you're so inclined, you can go to eoluniversity.com slash support. There you'll find three different ways that you can make a small contribution that will help keep this show and the podcast on the air Thanks in advance if you decide to do that. Now we'll move on with my interview with Dr. Remignanti. Today, I'm very happy to welcome my guest, Dr. Drew Remignanti. Dr. Remignanti is an emergency medicine physician who has lived himself with chronic illness since being diagnosed with ulcerative colitis at age 19. After suffering a major stroke in 1992, which sidetracked his career for five years, he earned a master's degree in public health and then eventually returned to full-time emergency medical practice. This journey inspired him to write the book, The Healing Connection, A Partnership for Your Health, uh, which we'll be discussing today. The book explores how dollar-driven decisions wield too much influence over our medical decisions as patients and sadly as physicians and as, as well, including at the end of life. And you can learn more about the book and when it's published and available on Dr. Remignanti's Facebook page uh, under his name, Drew Remignanti. And I will have that all spelled out in the show notes so that you won't try to have to try to figure out how to spell it. Um, but Dr. Remignanti, Drew, I hope I can call you. Drew is fine, preferable. Welcome. And thank you for joining me today. Well, thanks a lot for having me, Karen. I wanted to start our discussion, and, and I'll mention that your book, The Healing Connection, is an amazing resource, and it is packed with references. You you had to do so much reading and studying to write this book because it has so many references in it, 270 references, and uh, it's a really wonderful um, depiction of really our current medical system and a lot of the things that are going wrong and some of your ideas for how things could go better. And we won't be talking about much of that, but I highly recommend that people read the entire book to get the full picture of our medical system right now and, and issues that are going on. Because today, for my audience, we're going to focus in more on issues around the end of life. But I just wanted to give that plug for your book and hope that people will buy it and read it. And it's coming out in July. July of this hopefully, year. hopefully before mid-July. Yeah, so it's a brand new book, hot off the presses, uh, that people can get their hands on and really learn, you know, from an emergency room physician's perspective, uh, some of the serious issues that are going on in medicine. And, and I wanted to start by talking with you as an emergency room physician about what happens when people die in the emergency room, because I know that you've spent a lot of your time with these kind of scenarios when people come to the ER without an advanced directive. And maybe you could take us through some, some typical scenarios of what that's like. And it's heartbreaking and tragic from our perspective, but I think it's good for everyone to be aware of why they need to have an advanced directive that's accessible and available. Yeah, I think that's critical. I'm, I'm sure that I'm at risk as, as much as anybody being a stubborn individual for not being willing to anticipate the end of my life and being, uh, I'm trying to avoid that. What we typically see in the emergency department is patients come in without an advanced directive. And if that's, if they're really badly off, they will have already been intubated by the ambulance uh, personnel before they see me or immediately by me. And uh, um family often says something like, he wouldn't want to be kept alive on a machine like a vegetable, which is an admirable idea. But if you haven't expressed that openly and actually gotten it documented in a legal fashion, EMS personnel will ignore 
most of what you say and we'll just do it because emergency medicine is a full court press uh, attempt at everything. And that's often the correct thing because people, you don't know if people, what people's past medical history is and do they have a, a limited prognosis or not. So we're gonna do everything for everybody. We'd rather err on the side of doing too much than too little. So that's one side we see, which is people say, you know, I, he wouldn't want to live on a, on, a, on a machine as a vegetable, but that's not helpful. You need to think about that and have that discussion with your family member well in advance of and the ambulance needing to be called. And then the alternative thing we hear from people is, oh, he would want everything done. And then you go on to discover that the person has uh, advanced metastatic cancer. And you say, really, you really think he would want everything done? So one of the things you can do is with loved ones, have that conversation, uh, better yet in the presence of that person's physician, because the physician can guide you in terms of what questions need to be asked and answered so that you can delineate your, uh, your desires. And I know, I mean, still in our society, the statistics I read are that maybe 35% of people even have completed an advanced directive. I've even thought about what they might want if they were in this kind of emergency situation. And yet I would think far fewer people actually have that advanced directive with them when they're, when the, when the EMTs arrive and when they're in an ambulance, like, so the, they may have completed one, but no one knows where it is or it's exactly. not available. One of the tricks the EMS people say is they tell people to put it in your freezer because that's one of the first places they're going to look. You know, put it in a plastic bag in your freezer and because that's where they or look for it on the surface of the refrigerator in your freezer so it's readily accessible. Yeah, because uh, even people who've taken the time to complete an advanced directive may not have their wishes honored because it just isn't available in the moment. And I'm sure there are lots of stories about people collapsing on the street or being in an accident when they're not at home where their advanced directive is. So it seems to me like this is, it's, it's a really big problem and we haven't found a way to get around this yet. No, there's no, it's, and again, I acknowledge that it's a difficult thing to to conceive of of your own demise you know but uh, we're going to do everything and if you certainly it's easier for not maybe not easier but more a more accessible idea to people who received a poor prognosis from a bad diagnosis like you have an advanced cancer and i think those people are have the fortunate situation aspect of their situation where their doctor will bring it up but if you don't have something like that that then it's sort of on your shoulders to bring it up with your physician and a hard, hard conversation to broach. And so I'm curious if, say, if a patient has had a discussion with their family, as you say, you hear sometimes from the family, but is that not enough for you to be able to go on if they can't produce the, the record or if they don't know where it is or don't even know if that there is a legal record? Well, different emergency physicians make different calls on that. If I have, and it's, it's, tenuous situation because if your relative is trying to off you and says, uh, you know, that's poisoned you and you come in and, uh, and they say, well, let him go. He wanted, you know, so there's that. So you have to make an assessment based on all the people you've seen over the years. Does this pe person seem like a reliable one? How much do they know about this person? You know, I usually respect the wishes of the uh, family member who's there, who who's gives me the gestalt of being a reliable person. I had a colleague once who says he ignores everything they say. If they can't produce a paper, he'll intubate people. And that's, you know, that seemed to me more self-protective than considerate. And I've been willing to go out on a limb during my career and uh, follow um, people who seem like caring family members. But it's risky for, for me to say, well, how do I know this person doesn't have that person's best interest in mind? Yeah. Well, and, you know, any of the steps we take, like even intubating a person, the tube can be removed if it if the decision yeah. is made that that wasn't the right step, it can be removed. But if if the person is never intubated and they die because of that, we can't reverse that decision. So it makes sense why the default is that we have we have to do as much as is possible to do unless there's very clear direction not yeah. to do that. Yeah, I would make the additional comment that if you have a loved one who's in a some kind of a care facility, a nursing home or assisted living facility, that you should revisit that um, their end of life wishes probably monthly at minimum to make sure that if their staff turnover, you'd say, you know, I'd say, can you locate my father or mother's end of life paperwork? 
to make sure it hasn't been misplaced or lost. And I'd look at it and review it. Does that reflect what the last conversation you had that with that patient is? Because it's not unusual for us to get somebody come in by ambulance from the nursing home and they don't even have the paperwork with them for a number of reasons I address in my book. They're getting pressured to be productive and cut corners um, to save money for the private equity people who have bought their nursing home. So I, I'm not saying that they're untrustworthy, but to get a reminder from you as a uh, caring family member, she, you know, it's very clear that my mother, you know, she doesn't want to be intubated under any circumstances. That's easy if you, uh, there are other circumstances like with the recent COVID epidemic, people were being intubated and kept on ventilators for sometimes weeks and then coming off the ventilator as they recovered from their COVID. So it can be a you know, difficult call to make, but it doesn't benefit from no vet conversation. It benefits from multiple conversations. Absolutely. And could it, would it work if family members had a copy of their loved one's advanced directive with them so that they themselves could bring it into the ER when they come in? Yes, I, I would think that'd be a great idea as long as it's signed and witnessed and what sign, something that's dated, signed and witnessed. I would respect that. Yeah. I, and, I, and I think I always like to tell people sometimes, um, sometimes people have the impression that uh, doctors don't care that much and are just kind of cold and callous and don't really care what a per person's wishes are. But I try to explain to people we have these default processes in medicine because you can't make judgments just by looking from the outside until until you have more evidence or until you can do more studies to find out exactly what's going on. You don't know for sure what's happening might be reversible and you just don't know. And so that's why the default is do everything until you do know what's happening. That's exactly right. And some people are under the impression if they've done gone through this process with family members that the that document will be at the nursing home and at the hospital also. And it may be true that they are in both places, but if I don't have it front and center, so your suggestion of family members actually even having a copy on their person in, in case of a, you know, sudden emergencies, that's a good strategy. Yeah, I'm curious because it seems to me when we first started learning about electronic medical records that one of the hopes was, oh, everyone's advanced directive would be in the system, in the electronic medical record, and you'd mm -hmm. be able to see it immediate immediately when someone came in yeah ideally everything would be everywhere you know but very often if most of your records i happen to work in several at several times in situations where there was a, a neighboring hospital in the same town and people would unfortunately ping pong back from one to the other and say oh, oh all here's all her records are here when they got confused and all her records were actually over at the other hospital in town and some hospitals Many hospitals have different EHR issues that don't share records. And, and at that point, as an emergency doctor, I can't be taking time to uh, make that decision about intubation. If I think it's necessary, it's an instantaneous act. It's not something you can wait hours to. Exactly. I mean, and that's your job to act in the moment right now based on, on mm -hmm. what you know. Um, but you write about slow medicine, which is upstream slow medicine. I, I don't know, maybe slow medicine can happen in the ER, but the, the sl slow medicine concept is more about the kinds of care people receive before they end up in the emergency room. And I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about that, because I see that as a movement I'm hearing more and more about these days. Yes, I think it's an important one. It's, it's not as relevant to emergency medicine, as you say, but there are certain decisions we make. They're not end of life issues, questions, you know, is it advisable to get a CAT scan on a child who fell and hit their head? Now, that can be a slow, lengthy conversation. Is it advisable to be admitted to the hospital with a condition that you might be adequately treated for at home if you're an older person with a risk for contracting a hospital-acquired infection? So, But all the forces in healthcare nowadays are working against the idea of slow medicine because it doesn't take a brilliant business person to think the more people you can move through the system, the more charges you can generate and the more money you can make. And that's, you know, I think it's going to take a partnership between us as patients and us as physicians saying, we have to stop this nonsense. We have to slow things down and make deliberate decisions for the best of, for the best welfare of patients. Yeah, exactly. And as you said, the system itself and the forces within the system 
are pushing everything to speed up too much. So taking, decreasing the amount of time that um, physicians and patients spend together in the office, like that time has gotten shorter and shorter because there's such an emphasis on seeing more patients in less time. Also on just completing electronic health records because that's take that's taking up a huge amount of time for doctors too, which takes them away from time with patients. The time with patients is really should be something that they measure or they devalue. But the, again, if you're a business person, you don't value that because it's not your expertise. We value it as physicians. And if we make too much noise as physicians saying we need more time with patients, we basically, people have actually been fired for publicly complaining about pressures being brought on to bear on them to be productive that's not in the patient's best interest. And this is talking about physicians who are being employed by by another entity, because these days it seems a lot more rare that there are doctors just in private practice who are doing their own business within their own small little office or clinic. And um, which which is how it was when I first started practicing medicine, but but that that's been a huge shift in medicine now that more doctors are employed, I think, than self-employed. Yes, definitely, the self-employed doctors are in the minority at this point, or certainly less than half. Yeah, and but even as a self-employed doctor, there's kind of a lack of control when you're dealing with insurance companies and their expectations and electronic health records. You still have to go through. A, a lot of the same processes, whether mm. you're employed by someone else or not. Yeah, that's true. That's true. The uh, pre-authorizations for being able to order the uh, um, tests that you think your patient needs and the uh, medication that your patients need. One of the things that you emphasize in the book is the healing connection and the fact that the relationship between a physician and a patient has a healing power. It's very important. And it's that very relationship in a way that's being threatened by some of these changes in our system right now. Yes, it's, it's a transformation that's going on. It's really more of a process of corruption where the patient-physician relationship is being changed into the consumer-provider relationship. That we're viewed as consumers, as patients. How can we generate money for the business? And uh, they're trying to create a false equivalence between physicians and mid-level providers and and even alternative medicine providers, it's it's you want a skilled, you know, scientifically trained physician, and if you want to do additional uh, alternative medicine stuff or see mid-level providers in addition to that, that's okay. But for the business people, they want the person they can pay the least amount of money to take care of us as patients, not the person who's best for us as patients. And I'm interested because I'm trained as a primary care physician. And so I've been aware of the importance of that physician-patient relationship and having a long-term relationship and getting to know patients well. So I was curious about in the emergency room, you don't really have opportunities, I would think, for those types of relationships, but you are very well aware of the benefits and the power. Is, is that because of your own experience as a patient? I think More it's partly that, that I, I made a great, after my stroke, I was only 38 when I had my stroke. And at that point, I didn't even have a primary care doctor because I didn't see the value in it. I was a little short-sighted. I was young and relatively, relatively young and very healthy and thought, you know, when you're that, you're in denial about what can happen to you. And so then I got picked up a primary care doctor when I got admitted to the hospital. And of course, a neurologist consulted on me and she sort of acted as my primary care doctor because my only health problem was my stroke. And I think she, you know, the fact that we connected very personally and she had to give me the guidance ultimately is, was I, was I able to rehabilitate, to return to the practice of emergency medicine, which was important to me. And, you know, she wanted, she had to strike a balance to be realistic with me and not, you know, not falsely encourage me, but not discourage me either. And she perfectly threaded the needle, I think. And that was because we spent enough time, you know, talking to each other and, she, you know, perceived what would be best for me. So it doesn't have to be, you know, if you have a single problem, like a cardiac problem or a neurological problem, your specialist could act in that role, but better off to have a primary care doctor there. Does it seem to you that fewer and fewer people actually have their own primary care doctor that they see for most of their healthcare problems? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, one in my book, I quote this, uh, 
but it's gotten so bad that people are willing to say almost anything out loud now. This woman who was a C, is the CEO of a $1.5 billion healthcare system that I quote in my book was asked in an interview by a, a medical business uh, publication, what does she see as one concept that needs to be challenged in healthcare? And the concept she thought needed to be challenged was that patients need a primary care physician. The comment was they need primary care, but not necessarily a physician relationship. I was stunned and insulted and surprised and at the same time thrilled that she said it out loud because hospital administrators typically say, all we care about is the welfare of the community. And so she made it clear that that's not all they care about. And so that's what we're up against as patients and as physicians that people who are making the prime movers in healthcare nowadays are the people at the administrative level of hospital systems, health insurance systems and pharmaceutical companies and politicians have more input than we do as physicians or we do as patients. So as patients and physicians, we have a, an incentive to change the system, but we don't have the power to do it. Politicians and the people at the administrative levels of those institutions have the power, but no incentive because they're making pretty good money and or they're keeping their elected positions. So we need to rock the boat and we need to rock the boat as a team, as a partnership, patient and physician together. And from the end of life perspective, I think more people would have advanced directives that are completed or will, would have had a conversation around end of life issues if they had a primary care doctor that they trusted, who's been providing care for them over the long term, who really understood their their health situation very well, they would be much more likely to be advised by that doctor, you know, let's think about the future, let's do some planning ahead. And, but nowadays, even it, it I do hear even from friends of mine and people I know, they never see the same doctor twice, sometimes even for the same condition, they go to a clinic and they end up with different people every time. And there's no continuity with any one mm -hmm. physician. I, I quote, I, as you pointed out, I quote 250 plus uh, uh, references that make all of these points that we're talking about. So there's not just opinion on your side or opinion on my side. There's good scientific evidence for it, that when people trust their physicians and they know and trust their physicians, and additionally, they feel known by their physicians, they are far more likely to participate in the development of a care plan for any condition and, and of course also for end of life planning would be part of that and they're far more likely to participate in that and then follow that plan than if they are bouncing around from one provider to another but the system doesn't you know the dollar driven decision making doesn't care who the patient is in front of as long as they're in and out quickly and a bill can be generated yeah. And you quoted in your book from another book that I love, which is Compassionomics. And they've done extensive studies to show what a difference compassion makes in the care of a patient when that compassion comes from healthcare providers at any level. Um, but it's harder to show compassion for someone you've never met before and you know nothing about than someone you've developed a relationship with. And so I don't, I don't know if there's anything from that book that you wanted to mention here around compassion. Yeah, it was interesting because I do have a, I refer to that book quite a bit. In fact, when I read that book, I was almost disappointed because I thought that boy, those guys are saying a lot of what I want to say. And I thought, well, their book's going to have a big impact. I was disappointed. It didn't have more impact. And I wrote my book anyway, because I had some additional things I wanted to say, but that's a, a great reference for people to read. But the two articles that, uh, that they studies they did quote, one is showing that a, a scripted 40 second um, conversation that a healthcare provider has with a patient can have a very positive effect on their anxiety and their outcomes. And it takes a mere 40 seconds, they stowed. And at the same time, doctors early in their training don't feel like they have the time to show compassion. And that's again, because they're trying to meet too many masters. They're trying to do right by their patient, but they're being told they have to do this faster. They have to do this in addition. They have to master the electronic health record and dot all the T's, then cross all the T's, dot all the I's. That's so true. And that, and I love the study that said it only takes 40 seconds, a 40 second interaction of compassion had significant benefits for a patient. So which would mean, I think, even in the emergency room, when you're in a crisis situation, you can show compassion that could help a patient with 
with pain and anxiety or, or whatever they're experiencing. And is, is that something that you, yeah, I've, I think we, we, we try to make those connections, even though we know we haven't, we're meeting people for the first time, you know, almost constantly, uh, occasionally I'll see the same person a second time or even a third time, but almost always it's a fresh thing. And, and I try to, you know, acknowledge as much as I can, depending on what I have to do for them or to them, you know, that I acknowledge what I can understand about what they're suffering and show some compassion for what they're going through. Yeah. Well, well, it seems like um, it's such a great argument that 40 seconds of time made a difference. How can, how can we not find 40 seconds somewhere in our interactions? Yeah, it's, it's, it was, and then they have a yet one more, uh, the Good Samaritan study. I don't know if you recall that from my book. So they hear these, they take these seminarian students who are um, obviously committed to a career of compassion because they're going into and so then they put them in this in this conflictual situation where they say you need to get to this place at a certain time in order to give a presentation on the good samaritan of all things and then there's the uh, study uh, uh, designers have a confederate who they make lay on the ground along the path that person has to travel and be in obvious physical distress. But then when the patient, when the seminarian student gets there, they have their, they have to say, no, I don't need your help. So they have to present them that conflict, which is they need to get somewhere to help somebody else. This person obviously needs help, but he's saying he doesn't need help, even though to your, you know, to your eyes, it's clear he needs help. And the, students felt so conflicted that very many of them never really even stopped the health. They just went to meet the other need. So that's the position we're in as healthcare people. We have, we're trying to meet the demands of this taskmaster, our administrative folks. And yet we're seeing, we're having to deal with patients visibly suffering right in front of us, patient after patient after patient. And we're not given the tools or the time to meet that patient's needs. And we might, that's what leads to the concept of moral injury and burnout, because you think, in order to, to live with what I'm doing now, I have to keep that at arm's length. I have to keep that so far away from me that I can't really get in at my soul and heart, you know? And one of the ways you do that is by being abrupt and saying, okay, he said, no, I'm going, I'm out of here. Yeah, and, and the conflict is there's, there's no priority. The patients have not been made a priority in giving care to the patients in front of us. And as you said, so our our obligations are wide and to other entities, to the, the CEO of the company that, that owns our clinic or that owns the emergency room and, and the administrators who want us to complete our paperwork and do our charging for the insurance company and then the insurance company too. We have to document for them and we have to justify tests we want to order that it's, a, it's confusing because there's so many masters to serve and when it should be that the priority is just the patient. What does the patient need in front of you and how do you provide that care? Yeah. And I, you know, I, I don't think we're in a, the dilemma we're in in the United States is not an us versus them. I mean, it feels a little bit like us versus them. And I say that in my book a little bit. The us is us as physicians and us as patients, our colleagues in this, our partners in this. And the other side of the them is the people who are actually in charge of making decisions, the politicians and the administrative people. But I think they are only able to make the decisions they make because they keep the suffering of patients at such an arm's length that they, they if you're not experiencing it or seeing it, you can make your pure business decision because business ethics say you have to do what's best for the organization. But we, we need to re somehow reverse that priority in healthcare in the US. We have to say the needs of the patients come first, business interests come second. It's going to take a whole reimagining of what's being a success in the business world. And but I don't think it's unimaginable or unachievable for us to do that in the U.S., but it's going to take an all-hands-on-deck effort to do that. Yeah. So healthcare providers are just getting stretched thin in some ways by these competing interests pulling at them, and their heart may say to them, I only want to focus on this patient and what they need, and yet they're to keep their job, <laughs> they may have to attend to the other demands that are on their time. Yeah, if I was, uh, you know, I, I very often joked during my career that if you gave me all the power and all the money in the world, I couldn't change the course of U.S. healthcare, because it's really, it's really going to take, uh, I think, I think it's going to take a, a two by two uh, force where patients in 
their primary care doctors form a partnership, that, you know, an equal an equal partnership with different expertises. Um, have the medical expertise. You as the patient have the expertise of knowing how you feel and what you want to accomplish with your healthcare. And then together we have to tell the system what we're willing to put up with and what we're not. And one dyad's not going to do that, but innumerable dyads can potentially, you know, try to get the ship of healthcare back on course. Do you think we need changes in medical education as well? Do you think there's a problem with how students are being educated? I have, it's been so long, I, I hesitate to say. I think probably not, you know, because I, and I've met hundreds, I'm sure at this point, thousands of doctors, uh, both young and old during my career. I haven't met a single doctor who I didn't think that their number one priority was getting it right in regards to patients. You know, I've met a, a number in, in myself at times where I found myself making a decision that I regretted because I, at that moment, I had another motivation in mind. I want to satisfy my at the department director. I want to satisfy somebody else. But, you know, I think even the, you know, I think all doctors learned during the course of the medical training that getting it right for the benefit of the patient is priority number one, but then you're thrown into the soup where you've got all these other competing demands. And so I don't think you can educate people out of that. You have to change the system that they graduate into. Yeah. Well, I would say that one, one thing, um, you know, from my hospice training that I feel concerned about is that medical students don't get trained very well in the end of life issues. So they don't get, don't get much training. At least I didn't in death and dying or how to have conversations about end of life issues with patients. And I remember even being told as a medical student, we had a patient on our service that got transferred off and they said, oh, well, that person's terminal now. So they're not a good teaching case. So we're transferring them off and we'll bring a different Mm -hmm. patient on that you can learn something from it. Now I look back at that and think, oh my gosh, we all needed to learn from this patient who was dying on our service by being, by experiencing that, not having, you know, not having them sent away somewhere. And none of us knew when they died or, or what took place there. Yeah. I have a, some portion of one chapter of my book about end of life issues and the concept of spirituality and we use it both religious-based and non-religion-based spirituality in terms of the decisions it helps you to make at the end of life. And they teach that now in medical schools. We never got any of that in 1980-83 when I was in medical school. I was, I'm sorry, well, in 76 to 80 was when I was in medical school. There was no, we never talked about spirituality and healthcare, but now it's a topic that's being taught at most medical schools now. So I think things are getting a little bit better there. Yeah, that's good to see. And it just, it reinforces, well, I almost feel worried though for new doctors who are still coming out with even more kind of like heart-based tendencies toward medicine, yet they're still part of this cold system that's going to Mm -hmm. really put them through the ringer and stretch them apart as as they try to keep caring for patients, but have these other demands on them. And you write about, I guess what we're talking about, you write about the commoditization of medicine. I just wanted to yeah. have you kind of define that term and what you mean by that, because I think that's kind of the heart of this problem. Yeah. Well, I think it was in a, the reference I have in my book, it was in the last quarter of 2017, it was that healthcare, the healthcare industry was the greatest employer of people in the United States, surpassing retail and manufacturing for the first time. So there's a huge number of people involved, you know, employed by the current healthcare system we have in the U.S. So you have to generate money to pay all those people. And uh, it's been seen as a commodity similar to retail. You know, if you're you know, selling shirts, selling cars, you know, you're, you're selling consumer your consumer good we're selling, ser- selling or they're selling is patient care uh, interactions, and it's not a, it's not a consumable product, you know the, and yet, it's an easy way to make money. You can make bucket loads of money in America and, and deliver mediocre medical care because most people are not aware when they're getting mediocre medical care. Um, it's. Yeah. And and it's a, it's a good point. You know, when we apply these business principles, which probably are 
good ideas for running a business. They don't really work in medicine because, you know, if you, if you have a fast food chain, you benefit from making sure every restaurant knows how to make a hamburger exactly the same way and put it together the same way because customers expect that and they want consistency. They want it to be the same. So standardization is a good thing in that kind of scenario, but that doesn't work in medicine at all because every single one of your patients is different, has a different set of issues going on. Even if you line up 10 people with the same diagnosis, it's different in every single patient. So exactly we can't, right cannot standardize that type of care. You have to get to know each one of those patients and understand everything else happening for them. If you and I both are having heart attacks, your heart attack may manifest in a different way. And, uh, and then also your course of your recovery from that will depend on what your intrinsic uh, strengths and are and what other resources you have in your life in terms of supportive family, et cetera. And it's different for every person. And uh, one of the other things I touch on is the degree of optimism you have about your ability to recover from whatever health challenges life is giving you. I mean, you can't wish yourself well. I'm not, I don't, not trying to be Pollyannish about it, but the studies I quote show that people who have positive expectations about the course of their health sometimes will do better than people who have. So their subjective health evaluation is very often associated with, if it's positive, your subjective health evaluation, you have a longer, you have a lower mortality rate than people with better objective health status, but worse subjective health status. So the mind is a powerful thing in that regard. Yeah. So people who answer a survey and say, I'm in good health or I'm in great health, regardless of what's actually happening inside their bodies do better than people who see themselves as being in poor health and who think of themselves as being unhealthy. Yeah, precisely. And again, not to be Pollyannish about it, you, that can't, that's not sufficient for your medical care to wish yourself well, or to just expect to always be well. And it can undermine you at the end of life. If you have unrealistic expectations about your ability to recover from a you know, terminal disease or threat, life-threatening disease. But that kind of brings me back to the the um, patient physician relationship too, that it seems like you might be more likely to feel optimistic if you have a good solid relationship in a provider that you trust, that you believe is going to help you with what you need, someone you can go to and talk to that you may feel more optimistic and more positive about your health because you're you're connected in such a positive way to a provider. No doubt about it. I mean, yeah. it'd, be, it'd be different if you were just saying that because it sounds nice to say, but the studies support it, you know, not just like a single study here or there, study after study after study support what you just said. Yeah. And which again is one of the, it's one of the beauties of your book is that there's nothing in your book that hasn't been supported by studies and usually copious studies because you've done such a good job of documenting and referencing everyone. And so, so, you know, as you said, it's far from being Pollyannish. It's very scientifically based every single thing that you write about in the book. So something that has been demonstrated more than one time to be of value with patients, but I'm wondering, you know, where should people start? Like, where should the public start? Th those of us who are out here wondering, what do I do? I don't have a I don't have a primary care doctor. Like what suggestions do you have? Where can we begin? I would, and it is a difficult one. I would start with asking family and friends who their primary care doctor is and how satisfied they are with them. Uh, you can call the hospital in your, I, first of all, I'd choose which hospital in your geographic area you would want to be admitted to the hospital if you had to be. I live in an area where there's three hospitals almost equally distant from where I live. I favor the hospital that I used to work at. And so I picked a doctor who works out of that hospital after hearing from my neighbor in several houses over that they had that same doctor. And I was happy with that. And then of course, after getting those recommendations, then you have to see the doctor several times and make your own assessment. Is this somebody I, I feel I can work with? Can we communicate well? Does he or she listen to me when I talk? Does, does she seem to take in with what I'm saying? And and uh, so you have to, it takes effort, you know, and you have to create that relationship. We're past the point where we can rely on the old fashioned paternalistic uh, 
model where you went to the doctor and you just listened to everything they said and did what they said, or at least pretended that you were going to do what they said. It turns out that very often people take, you know, don't end up following the advice they got from a doctor. So it's a, it's an egalitarian, more of an egalitarian partnership where we both care. The business of our partnership is your health and you, you have to be as committed to your health as I'm going to be committed to your health. And together, you know, we can work on that and achieve great things based on what the studies show. Yeah. And well, you know, I, the two of us talking, like you and I have both retired from medical practice at this point, and there are a lot of physicians in our age group who are going to be retiring in the near, near future. And I feel a little worried about a healthcare shortage that there may not be a, enough doctors. And then that makes me worry for those who are still practicing that their burdens will grow even greater. And can we, ha can, what, what needs to be done to help our our colleagues who are in the middle yeah. of all this? Yeah. I think I almost opened up that Pandora's box in my book talking about the economic things that can be done, but I, I had to honestly say I, I'm pretty much a business imbecile, so I should not. All right, and uh, all right. and uh, you know we need to incentivize people going to primary care, young doctors in their training going into primary care, and you can do it in a variety of ways. You can. Uh, reduce the burden on primary care doctors, the documentation burden that one of the studies I quote said that if primary care doctor did everything that they were required to do by CMS to adequately document their interactions, it would take them 26.7 hours per day, you know, to meet all those. So, I mean, they're expected to do more work than can be fit into a 24 hour day. And yet they're the least well-paid specialty in medicine, the primary care doctors. So we, you know, we could decide that we need to incentivize people going into primary care. Is, I think would be the first place to start. Not that the not that the specialty physician should be paid less. The uh, Elizabeth Rosenthal, who's a um, New York Times uh, writer, internal medicine doctor, has had a great book called *An American Sickness*, in which and she I quote her in my book where the doctors are not where the fat is in the system in terms of where all the money is going. Um, there's way up to 30% of uh, medical expenses in the U.S. are considered wasteful expenses because they're either duplicative or they're for low, 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 qual low value interventions that patients want, and physicians want to give because they make money. And so we, there's a lot of fat in the system, but it's not what the doctors are being paid. It's understandable that as a patient, you know, you know that healthcare is expensive and you know doctors make good income. And so you think the one is dependent on the other. Doctors are making too much money and that's why healthcare is so expensive. But Dr. Rosenthal, you know, clearly documents that that's not the issue. And one of the other articles that I quote is a guy, Mark Bertolini, his name was, he was uh, an executive in Aetna and Aetna was buying CVS or merging with CVS and, uh, the merger did come off at the time the article I read, if it was, he was expected to make a half a billion dollars on the basis of that merger. Now, I'm sure he's a super bright guy and I'm sure I couldn't do, pull off that merger, which eventually they did pull off. And I don't know if he made his half a billion dollars, but you know, the, a lot of the fat in the system is at the administrative level. It's not in the uh, physician level. Yeah. So very true. So very true. And I do sometimes hear people lumping doctors in when they complain about healthcare, they complain about doctors equally and kind of lump doctors in with our system that people understand that our system is failing in so many ways. And um, so I guess you and I are here a little bit to say, take it easy on doctors because they're far more really good hearted doctors out there who are caring and doing their very, very best to give care and who themselves are also victims of the system. They're not the perpetrators. Yeah, that's definitely it. I, when, I was, when I was looking for an agent, when I was initially planning, trying to write my book and I thought, well, gee, I should get an agent and see if this is a sellable book. And one agent said to me, you know what doctors should do? They should, uh, or why don't they uh, um, get together in forums and, you know, consult about what they think is wrong with our healthcare system and initiate changes. And she's found, she found the, very, the, whole, the situation very distressing. And I had to write back to her, I'm sorry to add to your distress, but doctors are no longer behind the helm of the ship of US healthcare. We haven't been for a while. And, uh, 
and we already have forums uh, where and all probably all specialties certainly in my emergency medicine specialty there are a number of forums where we talk about what should be better should be done differently can be done differently would help us would help patients would help everybody but we don't have the power to institute those things yeah exactly exactly so hoping for change but understanding it's it's going to take a while and i like your message that patients and doctors need to team up together in order to try to bring change about yeah and uh, um and so I, I don't think people should feel despondent as patients. I think they should say, you know, I think we have more power as patients than we realize. We can say, you can overnight decide, I'm going to approach my healthcare differently. I'm going to become knowledgeable about my conditions. Next time I'm with my physician, I'm going to say, you know, I, I realized after reading Drew's book that I need to become a more activated and engaged patient in my own healthcare. Of course, then you have to get out of your own chair and help your doctor up back into his or her chair because they'll faint at the idea that you want to be more active. Um, but uh, um, and by being more active, you can you may find a doctor who's not ready for that, and then you might have to change doctors. But the the studies show that being becoming more informed about and being engaged in planning of and then following through on the plan you come up with your doctor, it can cut your mortality rate in half. You know, so it's not just we're not you know if you were doing 10 or 15% better than the other folks who didn't do that, it'd be so what, you know, but really I have multiple studies I quote show you can cut the mortality rate in half if you're a more engaged patient with your, so that's something as patients we could do overnight. Tomorrow I'm going to start as a different patient. That's in the context of studies that show that only 12% of U.S. population is considered fully healthcare literate. So an 88% healthcare illiteracy rate in the U.S., and wow. they define it. They define it healthcare literate as being able to acquire, understand, and apply healthcare knowledge. And many of us are just not capable of doing that. And the majority of us, apparently, according to this yeah. study. Wow, that's kind of shocking. You yeah, know, so to, it's 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 on that. us as patients too. It's we can't just stand by as patients and point at the system and say it's you, it's you, it's you. It's all of us. It's us against us, basically. Yeah. And you yourself, um, you know what you're talking about because you yourself have been a patient of the healthcare system, having lived with ulcerative colitis for all your life since you were 19 and then having had a stroke, which um, was certainly a major crisis in your life. So uh, it seems to me that you've gained a lot of wisdom from the patient perspective as, as well. And is there anything else that you would want to share ab about that? I always like to say I feel edu pretty well educated from both sides of the patient care, both inside it and alongside it. And the book really represents all the conclusions I came to about that. And I think, so I think it's a worthwhile read. And I throw in enough things I think have some entertainment value in and of themselves in the uh, in the uh, references. I, so I think I think it'll be a good read for people. But uh, I think taking on that responsibility of being an active patient in your own healthcare is key. Asking all the I I define it as a three-step process. You have to find and choose a primary care doctor who you can put your trust in, not um, as, you know, can fully trust that person. You need to ask all the questions that you, that occur to you when that physician gives you advice and so that you fully understand it. So you can be, you need to be all in on your healthcare plan. And if you're not all in, then you have to stop and say, hey, you know, this idea that I'm going to lose 10 pounds, even though I mentioned that realistically, I, I can't see that. Or the, the idea that you want me to stop smoking, I can't see me doing that. So that's the honest part of it. You have to say what, what, what's a realistic plan for you. And then once you come up with that plan in conjunction with your doctor, your commitment has to be, I'm going to do that without fail. Because if you, if you, if you go into the doctor's appointment knowing that you when you leave the room whatever you agreed upon you're committed to it's kind of like getting married in a sense every time you go in so you're not going to say i do to somebody who you're having doubts about or you shouldn't uh, so you shouldn't uh, leave that that interaction with the doctor without having all your questions answered and yeah you're going to make a bit of a pain in the neck of yourself and it might take a while for your doctor to get used to your style but if the, your doctor can't communicate with you then you need to probably move in to move on to somebody who you can communicate with I don't mean you should be trying to tell the doctor what to do, but you need to tell the doctor what you understand of what they want you to do and what you can see yourself following through with. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's such good advice and really important. And all of us will are most likely to become patients at some time or another. So we all have to really educate ourselves and plan ahead for that day when we are in the patient's chair uh, and trying to get our needs met. So I'll remind everyone I'm talking with Dr. Drew Remignanti about his book, The Healing Connection, A Partnership for Your Health, which is a great read. It's also filled with really interesting stories from the emergency room. Some are a little bit harrowing, but uh, is just loaded with studies and research and documentation for all of the all of the points that you make in the book. So Drew, I want to thank you so much. Thanks for writing the book. I'm so glad that you did. And that you, even though Compassionomics came out, that you went ahead and wrote your book. And I want to thank you so much for joining me to talk about it today. Well, thanks so much for having me on, Karen. And please, I'd remind people, as you said, if you go to my Facebook page, I'll usually have an update there on where things are at in terms of the book, how to pre-order it now. And here's my salesmanship pitch. If you pre-order my book now, you get a 20% uh, price reduction on the total cost of the book, plus the ebook version of my book gets thrown in for free, which you really want to have alongside you on some kind of an e-reader for all the hypertext linked references. And then the publisher threw in a second free ebook if you buy now. It's not that you can't get it later from Amazon or bookstores, you will be able to, but it won't be at the 20% discount. And I'm sure they'll charge you for both the paper book and the ebook. And as you said, it's good to have the ebook version because you can just click on those links and go directly to the studies that you're referencing in order to read it for yourself. And that's really helpful. Well, thanks again, Drew. And it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Well, thanks for having me on, Karen. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Drew Remignanti and that you'll get a hold of his book, The Healing Connection. Uh, there's so much good information in the book, and it's very revealing, actually, about our healthcare system and in some ways shocking to know uh, the state of our current healthcare system, but also something we all need to be aware of so that we can um, help instigate change where it needs to happen. So I'll be back next time with another interview for you and uh, we'll see you then. Bye-bye.